everyone. I'm Dr. Yosefa Fogel Rubel, and this is One on One Women Talk Torah, a series brought to you by Matan Women's Institute for Torah Study. Welcome back to Matan's One on One Parsha podcast, where we spend about 30 minutes discussing deep thematic points about the Parsha. This week's episode is sponsored in honor of the fourth yard site of Olga Isenberg, Alea Shalom. She was an Auschwitz survivor and made a new beginning in Miami, where she raised her family. If you would like to sponsor a podcast episode, please contact the Matan office via telephone or email me at podcast at matan.org.il. These sponsorships enable us to keep creating new content and are a meaningful way to mark both mournful and joyful occasions. Be in touch and together we can come up with a way to meaningfully mark your occasion. This Brashit series is titled Chosenness and Choices. The book of Brashit is propelled forward by God's chosen representatives, Adam, Cain, Noach, Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. But these messengers impact the world because of the choices they make, and it is the nexus between being chosen and the human choices that actualize this divine will in the world that we will be exploring in the coming episodes on Brashit. Parshat Veira is an entirely Avraham Parsha. It opens with Sarah's receival of the news of Yitzchak's future birth, which is the first revelatory stop on the travel route of the three messengers of God, after which they continue to stone to deliver God's punishment and save Lot and his family. Avraham engages in a debate with God, arguing with his attribute of judgment. We will focus on this conversation in today's episode. Then Yitzchak is born and we are thrown into a whirlwind of narratives. His youth is complicated by the presence of Ishmael who gets thrown out of Avram's house with his mother Hagar. It is a strikingly similar yet somewhat different story than the one told in chapter 16 which takes place before Sarah is a mother. There is a brief reprieve to discuss stolen wells and Avram flexes his muscle as arbitrator creating an alliance with Avimelech and his army general. Right after this, God commands Avram to sacrifice his son in the famous story of Akedat Yitzchak, which will also receive attention in today's conversation. Today, I am joined by a new guest, Dr. Avital H. Levy, who received her PhD in philosophy from the University of Arizona. Her research centers on the intersection between ethics and epistemology. She is currently writing a book on the role of loyalty in the ethical and political theory of the Hebrew Bible. She teaches in several women's seminaries in Jerusalem. Avital, it's great to have you on the podcast. Thank you very much for having me, Yosefa. So this is the second parasha that we're sort of focusing on the figure of Abraham. And this this series on the podcast is really focusing on the chosen leaders uh, of God throughout the book of Breshit. And in our previous conversation about Avram, we were really focusing very specifically on sort of the phrase of being a, a, a mishpacha, of the role of Avraham as as it pertains to the broader family and then the nation. Um, but today, I think our conversation is going to sort of focus more on the, the, the character and the personality of Avraham himself. And, you know, if we look just very cursory at the stories of Avraham, we, we learn very quickly that being God's chosen messenger doesn't mean that your life is easy. <laughs> it doesn't mean that you have a lot of children. And it also doesn't even mean that you necessarily have a smooth marriage, right? I Meaning it doesn't necessarily seem to, to guarantee anything that comes close to simplicity. And so I guess the question I would want to start with our conversation and really the the topics that you research and think a lot about is what do you think God is trying to cultivate in Abraham as a person? And we'll get to the question of what that means nationally, but what, what are we getting at with all these promises and these covenants with Abraham? What, where, where are we trying to get to? So I think this is going to be a theme throughout our conversation and we'll keep coming back to it, but I'll say it simply in the beginning as a title, and then we can keep coming back to it throughout the stories, is that I think that really what God is looking for in his messenger, in his uh, human being who's going to form a nation, is loyalty. It's the the characteristic of loyalty. And I think that's what God both finds in Abraham and both tests in Abraham and even is trying to strengthen in Abraham. So I think God starts off finding something in Abraham that was already there, but then he tries to strengthen it as we go along. And just to say a few words what we mean by loyalty, we mean a person who is both able to see that he's a part of something, something bigger than himself, 
so he doesn't see only himself, and is able to take initiative in order to strengthen that thing that he's a part of. And I, I think that this is not a character trait that we talk about that often, but I think that actually, and the reason why I'm interested in it, the reason why I'm researching it is because I think it actually is characteristic of what God looks for in human beings throughout Tanakh. So Moshe is called Evan Neman and David is called Bechol Beiti Neman, who that's Moshe, but it, it also says the same thing about David. It's something that God looks for, and even more, it even says about God himself. It says that God is Ha'ila Neman. But I think that even though this word is not used in Bereshit, it actually does string the stories, and we'll see that I think it characterizes Avram. The first thing that I'll say that I think maybe we don't think of very often, but happens in, in Avram's stories before this parsha, is that Avram and Sarah don't have children for many, many, many years. And they have a promise from God that they will have children. And we don't notice, we don't think about it, that it was so common in those days to take on another wife. And that Avram doesn't necessarily have a promise that the son is going to come from Sarah. Mm -hmm. But he chooses not to take on another wife until Sarah is the one who requests it, of course. We know that story in the previous Parsha. But Avram sticks by Sarah. He understands that the, their marriage is something greater than just his own future. He's looking to their to their joint and shared future. And his loyalty to Sarah is also an indication for his loyalty to God. God makes this promise, but it's one year after another, after another, after another. We can't even imagine decades that they're waiting for this child. And Avram is loyal to Sarah and he's loyal to God. And he says, I'm not going to give up on God's promise. God made this promise to me. I'm not going to budge. I'm not going to leave. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to say, I'm going to find some other God who's better and quicker at keeping promises. He holds on to this promise that God is going to, is going to fulfill his promise in the end. Right. It's so almost think, as if Avram sort of intuits a certain intimacy, right? We've, we've in previous years, perhaps even on the podcast, we've spoken quite a bit about how stories of two wives never really end well. We are first, model of a relationship is one man and one woman. We have that from Adam and Chava. It's very clear that that's the proper paradigm and everything else is a certain sort of aberration from the proper paradigm. But that is that is fascinating. I really never thought about that, that he's never the one who initiates that, that second relationship. He does, by the way, interestingly, after, right after Sarah dies, there's a whole list of Abraham's continued life and that that's an interesting piece in and of itself. But, but you're saying that his his loyalty to God is sort of mirrored in his loyalty to his wife. Is that That's what you're right. trying to say? Right. The reason why I'm calling it loyalty is because he's not willing to give up and because even though it's hard to stay mm -hmm. in this marriage and to stay in his relationship with God over the decades, he doesn't give up on it. He, he waits and we'll mm -hmm. see that he also takes initiative later in this Parsha. Beautiful. Okay. So let's, let's sort of explore this idea of the, of the loyalty. We see in this Parsha that God also views Avram as his servant who's a partner, right? As someone who's, who's active in, in helping God make the world a place of justice. We see that in the story of Avram turning to Avram. God says, I can't cover up from Avram. And we, we need to think about how dramatic this is. The God who created the whole world just at the beginning of Bereshit, he thinks that he can't hide something from a human being. And it's not... It's clear that he thinks this because he says, God knows that Avram is the kind of person who's going to be able to teach his children and his whole family for generations to build a whole society of justice. And God views Avram as a partner in this, as his partner in bringing justice into the world. And the way God acts with his servants, with his avadim, is that he thinks their opinion really matters. He turns to Avram. He tells Avram what's about to happen in Sodom. It's just, it, it's really, it's mind boggling. I think that that's the meaning of the word evid here. It's not a slave like in Mitzrayim, but rather someone who is able to follow and serve and, and help promote the, the, the purpose of the leader. God is the leader here. Why don't you take us through a particular story in our Parsha and let's sort of understand how this loyalty, how this trait, its attribute of Abraham it plays out. Okay, so before we before we turn to, to what loyalty is not, 
and we see this in this parsha, which is not, it's not obedience. I th- I'll, I'll just say a few more words about what we know about Avraham at the beginning of this parsha. Mm-hmm. We see that he brings people into his home. And we have a tendency to imagine that Achnasat Orchim and Avraham's time is the same as our own. I think we're all learning from Avraham and we're all inspired by him. But we also are often hosting people who have their own home, who have a place to go, who have other, other options of where to eat. And what's in what we need to understand about Avraham's Achnasat Orchim is that he's taking people under his wing. He's bringing people to join his family who, I mean, they don't live in a society where there, you have endless communities, where we have all the many, many friends and family. I mean, he's living in a, commu- in a world where there's war between different tribes and he's bringing people to join his family and to come join his his upcoming tribe. And it's interesting that there's a juxtaposition between Avraham and Lot's achnasat orchim. So we know that Chazal say that Lot learned his achnasat orchim from Avraham. Mm-hmm. But it's also important to notice the difference that the Torah tells us what happens in Lot's house. When Lot brings Achnasat Orchim into his home, he's willing to give up his own daughters in order to save the lives of his guests. So it seems like the Achnasat Orchim is not, I protect everyone who comes into my house. I protect everyone who's under my wing and is un- is part of my tribe. But rather, I want I need to make room or I need to, to show favor to these strangers and therefore I'm willing to give up on some people who are in my home. And the Torah does not view this positively, right? We shouldn't be confused that it's striking that Lot's family falls apart once he makes this decision to sacrifice his own daughters for the sake of these strangers who he's bringing to his house. Well, so his even daughters Achnasat in some way get him back, right? Meaning they don't mean it as revenge at all, but there's obviously a very strong, uh, a very strong irony there that those daughters that he might have been willing to give up end up involving him in something that is far beyond his will or right. conscious but before knowledge. That happens, right before that happens, Lot tells his son-in-laws, we need to leave this terrible place. He's trying to save his whole family, but his son-in-laws won't follow him mm-hmm. and his other daughters stay in Sodom. Yeah. And we can just imagine if his family wasn't falling apart in this way, if his family felt like he was looking out for everyone and they really viewed him as someone who could lead the whole family out of Sodom, Maybe his other, maybe the daughters who end up doing this in- incredibly horrific thing with him af- after they leave Stone, maybe they wouldn't have acted that way if their family had all left together, right? Mm. So, so saying there was a crack uh, there, there was a fissure there in the family structure to begin with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because Lot thinks that Achnasat Ochim comes before defending his family, and he's willing to sacrifice his own daughters for the sake of these guests who he barely knows, then his family doesn't view him as a leader anymore. They don't view him as someone who's really looking out for the best of the family anymore, and they can't follow him out of stone. Therefore, he's left with only these two daughters, and the daughters have an experience of the whole world is falling apart. There's nothing we can do. There's no no one we can turn to. There's no one who's continuing humanity, and they feel like the only option they have is, is to have... To have relations with their father, but that's because their own sisters and their own brothers-in-law, and I don't know, maybe they were also children, were left in, in Sodom. So all this to say that there, this is also important looking forward because we are going to get to the Akedah. That on the one hand, I think we're supposed to view Avram's achnasat orchim, his ability to bring people under his wing, to bring them into his home, to protect them, to feed them, to take care of them, as his ability to lead. And I think that. We see here that someone who's following God, who is an Eved Hashem, is someone who's also leading other human beings, right? Those go together. They're not, mm. they're not opposed. Someone who is following God is taking on the responsibility to lead human beings. We also see how it fails. We see that it fails when you make, when a person like that, who is a leader of his own family, starts making choices that where he's prioritizing other people over his family. But this is also gonna is a warning for us about how we're supposed to think about the Akedah because Avram is going to be asked to sacrifice his own child. I mean, he's and, going to be asked to also choose between his children before that, right? We can't say that there right. weren't fissures within Avram's family, but Avram himself was not happy with that, right? He has to be sort of pushed by his wife because he didn't want to make that choice where he feels like he throws somebody out of the house. You know, he, he leaves he leaves somebody vulnerable. Uh, so I agree that that does, that does contrast with Lot, but in, the, in terms of the, the final product, we have a family that, of course, also has a certain degree of fissure, but 
but the difference I think is, is that the Torah makes it very clear that this was a divine will, meaning he, they needed to be separated. It wasn't that he was thrown out or cast aside or chosen over, but that this is part of the divine plan that they not, they not actually grew up together in the same family. Right. But I think that it's interesting that the parsha sets, th- sets things up for us in this way, right? That we first see what we're definitely not supposed to be. We're not supposed to be Sdom and mm-hmm. we're not supposed to be Lot, the mm-hmm. way he acts in Sdom. I don't know if that was his choice or the influence that he had, but right. that's not what w- the Parsha is telling us in advance. We're going to be talking about really, really, really hard choices within the family, mm. but we're not talking about giving over your own children to the enemy, to someone who's attacking you or attacking your guests. That's not the conversation we're having. We are going to have really difficult choices within the family. That's very nice. Um, I don't. I mean, I'm sure we'll get to the akeda further in the conversation, but I don't think I ever thought about those two specific elements as juxtaposed of the akeda as sort of a continuation of of what happens with Lot uh, vis-a-vis his family in the story of Stone. So we we talked about how God does not expect obedience, and I think that really before we get to the akeda, I think this is not a mistake that we have first that we have the story of God turning to Abraham and talking to him about what's going to happen in Sodom, mm-hmm. hearing his opinion. And we see that Abraham stands up to God and argues with him. And this is, I think, one of the most shocking stories. It's, it's, a, it's a story that it will be repeated in a way when Moshe stands up to God to defend Amisled. But here we have Avram, who's the first one to ever do this, to stand up to God and argue. Noach did not stand up to argue with God when God told him that he was destroying all of creation, pretty much. And Avram does stand up. And it's, I think, important to notice this for two reasons. One is that loyalty is not obedience. That's what I was saying before. Loyalty is not just saying whatever God said, whatever God told me to do, whatever God decided just is right. But also, I think it's important to sit, to show and see how Avram argues with God, right? So first, he, God, Avram turns to God and he says, Hashofet kol ha'aretz lo yase mishpat. He's turning to God because he, he himself believes that God is just and does justice and is a judge that judges according to justice. So he's turning to God because he thinks that God will listen, because he really believes that God wants to hear what he has to say. Because that's what a just judge does, right? When someone is in the position to be a judge, he needs to hear all the sides of a case. He needs to hear the defendant and to hear what what reasons there are to maybe defend the person who's who's being put on trial. And Avram puts himself in in the place of being of being the the, the lawyer. But not only is Avram turning to God because he believes that God really is uh, shofet shofet tzedek, but also he turns to God with a lot of humility. And we see that he says, right? That's the way he views himself. So it's clear that the argument is not for the sake of Avram feeling like he had something to say, right? It's not so he can prove that he has something to contribute to God's picture. This is not, this is not a, an ego war about who's more right. It's clear that Avram thinks that God is the one who's the judge. And he is the one who's coming to suggest maybe that there's something that God then God might have missed. And I think that as much as crazy as that is to think, I think that's the way we have to read the story. That Avram says, it cannot be that you're just going to destroy a whole city if there's some people in there who could save the city from within. I think that as Avraham lowers and lowers the number, he's still holding on to, this is really a, a political theory, right? He says, a a city can make tshuva, can return if there's 50 people there who are still good, or if there are 40 people there who are still good. Good, And we also need to notice when Avram stops, right? So there's a point when Avram says, okay, below 10, it's not, it's not possible that a city will really return. And, I think and, also Avraham is drawing on some of his own experience, meaning he himself is trying to create a certain like moral ethical revolution, right? And we the ten, the number ten obviously is significant because of Minyan, and it takes on other significances later in rabbinic literature. But I think Avraham, throughout his own journey, is discovering like what's realistic. How how can you really turn the tides, right? And he's I, we don't have those details from his own other stories, but I can only imagine that, you know, based on his own experience, he's he understands what kind of bulk of presence you need in order to actually shift the attitudes of a place. Right. And I think that that's 
that's what Avram has to contribute. What, what Avram knows is the way human beings act because mm-hmm. he's a human being and because he's tried to lead other human beings in making a change for the better. And he's willing to argue with God so long as he thinks that Sodom has really some way to turn, to return back and, and become good. He's not standing up to God and saying, justice is just save them no matter what. Yeah. I think also one of the ways that you always see in, in that conversation in the 18th chapter of Rishit that it was sort of, they're trying to get at a principle. The conversation seems to sort of like end in mid-sentence a lot of times. Uh, the last pasuk, uh, it says, well, they get to the number 10 and then it just says, kasher Avraham v'avraham that they, they each went back to their own places and you kind of, I, I'm always thinking like, well, did they check if there were 10? I mean, like what, what happened in that moment? And it's at, I think it's at that moment after we get to the number 10 and then it's sort of, they just part ways that you realize that they were kind of having more of a philosophical conversation than they were actually, than they actually thought that they were going to be able to implement this plan. I'm not saying that they didn't intend to look, but there's something in the way that the Tanakh presents it that lets you know that we're getting here to a moral principle, which as you said, is a principle of justice while also dealing with the reality of humans. Humans need to be punished. There need to be consequences um, because, you know, it's not like they go right after and then start, you know, counting, counting heads in, in stone. It seemed, it seemed very clear that stone was, itself was not going to be able to be saved, but that Avram was trying to whittle out a particular principle uh, in his in his conversation with God. Um, and I think I agree that it's very, this is one of the, I think the, the the more morally significant passages probably in all in all of the Torah uh, when God also says I want to partner with humans when it comes to morality meaning ultimately you're the ones who have to live it out in the world so I do want to hear what you have to say uh, and uh, but ultimately there has to be a there has to be a stopping point that if you're not going to live up to that then then I can't possibly then this world won't be able to function when Avram is torn about what to do within his whole fam in all, his own family. God tells him, There's something that Sarah sees that you don't see. Right? So Avraham has these two sons. He has Ishmael and, and Yitzhak. He followed Sarah in agreeing to have to bring Hagar into the family. And it was at Sarah's request that, uh, that he had this son Ishmael. But things didn't turn out the way Sarah thought. I think she thought that she would be able to consider this son her own son and raise him as her own son. Yeah. And it didn't turn out that way. Right? It's very clear that, that Ishmael's not under under any guidance from Sarah. And as soon as there are two sons in the picture, then uh, we find that Ishmael is mitzachek. And for some reason, we don't know why. That's either because of um, loves both sons and he, he can't imagine that one is mitzachek or because he's just not willing to choose between them, but whichever one it is, Sarah is the one who makes the choice, right? She's the one who says, we need to choose between the sons, and she makes a demand that the Ishmael will be sent away. And I think it's interesting that we were talking before about obedience, and there, you could think that here, when God says, Kola shel tomar bekola, you could think that really what God is saying is that you should obey whatever Sarah says. And it's interesting that before, when Sarah says to Avra, in the previous stories, when Sarah says, tells Avram to bring Hagar into the family, their God doesn't intervene. Right? Mm-hmm. Their God doesn't say, oh, whatever Sarah says, Shema Bikola. I think that God is talking about right here in the choice between the sons. Right? He's not saying you, there's, there is such a thing as somebody else always tells you, you have to follow somebody else's opinion all the time. You always need to be checking and trying to figure out and arguing, trying together to figure out what's the right decision. I think that when that it was a mistake, and that God thinks it was a mistake that Sarah brought Hagar into the family. But here, God definitely is coming out on on Sarah's side, and He's saying there's something that Sarah sees about making a really difficult choice between your children and between Avraham's children, and you need to listen to Sarah. Here, she she sees the she sees what's going to bring continuity to to your national effort. What's going to bring to really having a, uh, an am that's going to be uh, doing tzedakah or mishpat. And she sees that having both Ishmael and Yitzchak in the family is not going to allow for that. We're very concerned about the persona of Am Yisrael at this moment, meaning the the, DN, the personality DNA. And again, the, we, we know that the commentator is trying to figure out what does it mean, mitzachik, but, but at, at its minimal, it has to do with something that is not the... I don't even want the word serious, but it's not it's not the the line that God is trying to create. It's not the the persona and perhaps also the 
the occupations that that he wants Am Yisrael at its root to be to be dealing with. I guess I always read that intervention on the part of God as just clearly letting us know how much Avraham didn't want to do this. Um, but you're adding another layer, which is that, well, usually God suggests to his main his main chosen one that you should be in dialogue and be thinking and be critically thinking and taking into consideration here I need you to just listen, right? And you're saying that that's not the, that's not the go-to. The obedience isn't the go-to. And therefore, when we want obedience, God has to clearly intervene. If I'm understanding you correctly, that's, that's the emphasis here. That because loyalty means something broader, it means being in dialogue and taking others into consideration when God wants obedience, he has to be really clear and have a very, I would say, strong intervention on his part. I think there's also an important, it's important to notice here that both Sarah and Rivka are the ones who who understand who the son is, who yes. can follow yes. and continue the family. Mm-hmm. Um, and th- that may not carry on to Rachid and, and Leah because the choice there is not is not as difficult, and we, we don't see that. But it's very clear that both Sarah and Rivka are the ones who are making the choice. Um, for Avram, it means he has to, for Sarah, it's easier because it's not one of her sons. For Rivka, it's going to be more difficult because she's choosing between her own sons. Yeah. Uh, so it's like she has to make Sarah's decision, but in Avram's place. I think you're right. The here, the, the Torah is definitely suggesting that we're making a choice because of the personalities of the sons. And... It's not the kind of choice that we saw before in Tzedom, where we're sacrificing some people in order to save others. That's not the sacrifice that we're making here. That's not the story that's being told. Rather, if a family is going to have a certain tradition and is going to teach certain ways of life and is going to continue that tradition into the next generation, it really matters which of the children are, are committed to that and which children are not. Now, in our families, we, we're not in the situation that Avram is in. We don't, we're not a single family in a, in a hilltop surrounded by, by war where the consequences of one child making different decisions is so extreme that we have to send them away. Right? We're not in the situation mm-hmm. that Avram is in, but, but we definitely are faced often, I think, with these cases in which we have to make hard choices about how do we maintain a certain environment in our family? How do we maintain that people are both being moral towards each other and that they're keeping our tradition and keeping and living on that tradition? And I think that situation we can, we can sympathize with, even if the, the drastic, uh, the drastic steps that Avram has to take are not the ones we, t- we need to take in our own lives. In families where they are representative of an idea, right? Avram's family represents an idea or an ideal or a morality. So again, the have deal, but think about the royal family, okay? Or think about, you know, I'm thinking of uh, Hasidic Hasidic leaders and the that their children have to run a chatzel or be sort of their successor. These are decisions that are weighed heavily. The choice of who marries who is not your personal decision only, right? Meaning it's part of what gets taken into consideration. But there's because you represent something and you aren't just yourself, so all of these decisions have have tremendous. Uh, they have many, many aspects that need to be taken into consideration. And so I think that we see very much the the beginnings of that here. What your roots are, where you're from, what makes up parts of you, what are the things you're interested in. For regular folk, that's just, you know, part of the mishmash of who you are. But when it comes to people who represent an ideal and, and have to be something that's symbolic almost, so all those things and all the little elements that go into the recipe of who you are are, are highly uh, impactful. We are supposed to see these stories as instruction for us. So maybe we don't need to send any of our, our children out of the house the way that Avram does. But we are supposed, to, I think, when we're raising our children, when we're choosing, when we're helping them choose spouses, when we're when we're making choices about how to raise our children, I think we are supposed to be thinking we're we're part of a, a nation, and any choice that we make contributes to what this nation is going to look like. Any choice that we make is never just a personal a personal choice. Every choice that we make affects other people. Whether I keep Shabbat or not affects my children, it affects my, na- my neighbors, it affects my neighborhood, mm-hmm. right? The, these things have, have uh, because every mitzvah yeah, they that have we ripple effect. They have a ripple effect they on have the world around us. And they, and they help build up or pull down our tradition. And I, yeah. I, I think that this is, it's really important because we live in a society that's super individualistic and we are taught 
to think about what's best for me personally and focus on, on getting myself ahead in my career, in my marriage, or in whatever ways that, that we think about ourselves as individuals. But I think that actually the Torah's view is very different, is that, yes, every individual matters. Every individual is B'Tselem and Okim, but every individual is also contributing to something or helping to destroy it, right? Those are the two options. That, that's what Avram is arguing about with God. He's saying 10 people, 10 individuals, they can turn a whole city around. Mm. But they only do that if they tried to turn the whole city around, right? They, they don't do that if they <laughs> say whatever, or, or, or we can't affect anybody else. Uh, <laughs> so I think I think that, that that's the Avot's greatness, is that on the one hand, they're, they're running their own family. They have a family just like anybody else. But on the other hand, they're able to see with the perspective that their choices are going to decide whether there is going to be an um, an um that is just or not. And they're trying to make choices looking into the future in that way. brings us to the Akedah. Really, the Akedah is not a story that God ever puts any human being in again. If we look back at the stories we just saw, the story, and especially God standing up to God, God turning to Avram, listening to his opinion, and Avram willing to stand up to God and make demands, I think it's clear that as, a, as opposed to the way some religious people and some non-religious people read this story it's not a story of obedience it's not god says sacrifice your son therefore you just and that's and that makes i'm picking you and keeping you because you listen to me yeah right it's personally atrocious and it's also morally atrocious Mm -hmm. right it's something that no god should demand and yeah. And of course, a God who says that he's Osset Stakal Mishpat, how can he demand to sacrifice your own son and to sacrifice a, a human being who's who's innocent, who didn't do anything wrong, to just get up and kill him? I mean, I mean, it's just right. We're supposed to be shaken by it. We're supposed to think that this is incredibly difficult, both because God promised Itzhak for so many for so many decades, right? Avram and Itzhak and Sarah are waiting for this one son for decade after decade after decade. And that was that was a test just as much as Akedah is a test, right? That was an Isayon, and they stood in the Isayon. And then God, at the beginning of this parasha, God says, Ka'et chayav, right? I'm, now I'm giving you a real date. There's going to be an actual date when you're going to have a son. And that son really comes. And Yitzhak births is is a is a testimony, like it's a proof that, look, we, it, we were right. We waited for God. We were Neimanim to Hashem. We waited for His for God to save us, to bring us the Son. In the end, He really did, right? So, it, not only is is Yitzchak an innocent person who you shouldn't kill for no reason, but also he is the the symbol of the Brit between Avram and God. And obviously, there's also Avram. a really striking difference, and also in the story of Storm, right? He fights back when it comes to destroying a city. And then it comes here to his son, and he doesn't say anything, right? There's something really, there's really something really striking about that. It's almost that in the command itself, he understands. You know, it's like when you tell your child something, and when they feel that there's room to debate, like they start debating with you. No, maybe we'll have three books, or no, well maybe I'll come home at eleven, right? Because they kind of felt. But if you, in your in your allowance, or in your your the way you spoke. I'll see you at 11, right? And then they know there's no way that they're going to be asking to come later. And so it seems that already in the way that God presents it to Avram is that Avram realizes that there is no conversation to be had here. This is not like Stone where God was inviting him for a conversation. Here he is giving him a command. Now we'll have to unpack what that means in terms of obedience versus loyalty, but you know, he, when he says to him, et binchat, yechidcha, asher et yitzchak, v'chulei, v'chulei, he... Avram understands from that sentence that this is not a conversation starter. I don't know if it's more of a command than lech lecha meltzecha, right? Kach neit bitcha bincha. Yeah, no, I think it's supposed to echo that. I think it's a very, it's a similar, also there, he didn't say, well, how long does it take? Who should I bring with me? Right, meaning he also right. didn't open right. up in conversation. Right. He didn't argue and he didn't ask for detail. Yeah. Um, I'm just saying that it, that it's on the same plane as lech lecha, right? Lech lecha, right? 
it is a command. It is bilshon tzivui, right? But it also we read it as an opportunity. Yeah, it's like it's a mission. It's a mission. It's much more exactly. less than a command. I, think I that's know. I agree the with right you. Right way to call it. I think it's a mission, and we don't usually think of the akedah as a mission, right? We usually think of it as this terrible, terrible zerah that falls on Avram. Yeah, we only know it's a mission because of the end of the story. Because when he doesn't do it, and we see what God thinks of him, we realize, oh, well, he was getting at something else. But I, I agree, the opening of it is not necessarily clear, but the end. Becoming a Yere Elohim, oh, that's apparently kind of what God was trying to figure out, right? Or was trying to illustrate through Avram. Right. So I, I think that it's, if it wasn't for the story of Sodom and God stand, and Avram standing up to God, we would read it as a story of obedience. We mm-hmm. would re, we might read it as a story of whatever God says you have to do. Okay. We just have in the background that that's not always the case. Okay. Right. So then we have to figure out, okay, if, if the story is not teaching us whatever God says, just do it just follow, just do what you're told, then what is it teaching us? And I think that it, that the most important line, we really don't know what's happening in Avram's mind. But that's true in general in the Chumash. We don't often get a lot of explanation of what of what the Avot and the Imaut are thinking. But here we have we have a little bit of an insight when Avram says, when Yitzchak turns to Avram and he asks, well, where where's the sacrifice? And Avram says, Hashem yirel, Right? So we have some indication that Avram says God is the one who's going to provide the sacrifice. He doesn't lie to Yitzchak. He doesn't tell him, uh, oh, I have this other sheep that's coming. And he doesn't say straight out, I'm going to sacrifice you. Right? He makes it clear that his view is that God is the one who's going to provide the way to, to solve this situation. And I, I think that it is important because what Avram is holding on to is that God is just and that God is choosing Avram and is choosing Yitzchak. God, God believes in Sarah's choice that, Avram, that Yitzchak is the right one to be the next son and to continue Avram's mission. I think Avram's holding on to this view that that's what God is really like and that's what God is really going to is going to fulfill those promises. But he doesn't see how. right? And I think that when he knew that God was clearly wrong, he argued. But here, as you said, God gives him a, a direct uh, mission, which is go put your son on, on the Mizbech. And he doesn't know how to get out of it. He doesn't know what the other option is going to be. But I think he is holding on to the view that God is just and God is going to find a solution. And I think that God is testing him. But in a way, Avram is also testing God. So I think God is testing Avram because he's saying there has to be situations in which you don't understand how things are going to be turn out. You don't know how they're going to turn out just. You don't know how they're going to turn out as God bringing justice into the world. And you're willing to follow, right? Because in the end, I don't think it's enough for Avram to take initiative. We've seen him take initiative so much, right? He's the one who is following when he goes in into the land of Israel, but he's fighting the wars. He's he's uh, setting up his family. He's sending um, people to, to find a wife for his son. We see him take initiative all the time. And then he stands up to God and argues with God. And God supports that, right? God thinks that all of this le- leadership and initiative is good. That's partly why he chooses Avram, because Avram is able to do that. But it's specifically those people who can take leadership who also could lose sight and think that in the end, they have the whole plan. They know everything. They know how things are going to turn out. And God is testing Avram because he's saying, let's say that those things that were clearest to you, what if the things that were clearest to you were taken away from you? And the Nisayon is not, in the end, is he really going to kill his son? Because in the end, we find out that there's no way that God wants a father or a mother to kill their son, child. There's, there, there isn't a situation in which God really requires that. But God does want to know that we're able to take the things that are most important to us, that seem most obvious to us, that are most clear to us, and say, well, God is the one who's in charge and not me. And I think that's that's what loyalty is about. Loyalty on the one hand is taking initiative, it's arguing, it's saying, I'm contributing to something that's greater than me, and therefore my contribution is really, really important because I'm making because my efforts are really important. But also being loyal is saying, but there's someone else who's in charge. I'm not the one who's in charge. God is the one who's in charge. But when you're talking about setting up a whole nation, 
if it's going to be a just nation, then justice requires that people often have to give up things that are important to them. I think also he's definitely he's... able to lead when he knows what the mission is, when he mm-hmm. knows where we're, where we're all going, where he can take his men and go fight, right? That it's clear to God. And he's definitely able to point out to God when God is kind of seems to be missing some of the picture to say, well, what about this part of the picture that you can't see? But God doesn't yet know if Avram can also act on God's behalf and follow God when he doesn't see where, where we're going. Why are we going? Um, so I think that's the test Avraham. And on the other hand, I think Avraham's testing God because I think that if in the end God really would have gone through with standing by while Avraham was killing his son, then the Brit would have been over. There would have been no Am I, th- I think that that's clear from the story because the, the Brit between Avraham and God is that they're going to have a just people that they together are going to mm-hmm. bring a nation to the world that's going to be, be just and then bring blessings to the whole world. And if that if Avram had killed the son, I mean, you can imagine, maybe they, he could have had another son, but but the mission that they shared together would, would have been over. There was no, there is no justice. God's bringing, he's bringing him to his bottom line, right? Meaning after all this, this, this life that they're creating together and that this mission that's happening, there, I very much, I think it's a very powerful reading that ultimately God is showing Avraham on one hand, you know, who's in charge, even if you can't see what's at the other end of things, but also that Avraham had a clear faith that this most likely wasn't going to happen. If this is going to happen, I'm going to have to do it because that's, that's the relationship I have with God and he's leading me. But that I, I agree that the, the reading and the language surrounding Avraham's behavior in the story it seems to suggest that he he did think there was going to be some some other plan that was going to to reveal itself along the way um i we do we do have to wrap up our conversation so i just wanted to to sort of highlight again this piece really that you're bringing through this entire conversation which is this the idea that what what God is trying to cultivate in in Abraham, who is creating a paradigmatic family, and who, you know, who, who, where all the elements are extremely important, not just for their own family dynamic, but for the the spiritual DNA that they're creating in the world for for Am Yisrael, um, but also this idea that he's cultivating in Abraham. A, a relationship of loyalty. Within loyalty, there also has to be a certain degree of obedience, or as you said, you know, these things, this, this relationship can't operate. But it's a relationship that is a lot more bandwidth than just a relationship of uh, of obedience. There is there is dialogue. There is an openness to change, right, on, on both sides. And they're sort of together weaving this this moral fiber that they're going to be bringing into the world and be and be inculcating into the the groundwork of, of what the world looks like. So I think that that's a, a really powerful idea. I think it also, in interesting ways, and our listeners will think about it on their own, but it really parallels nicely with the conversation we had in the previous week about about Avraham and what it means to be an Avraham and Goyim. Uh, and uh, I really thank you for this conversation and taking the time out to talk about this. Thank you so much, Yosefa. And may we all have shalom. Peace. Amen, amen, amen. I hope you've enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. I'm Dr. Yosefa Fogel-Rubel, and this is One on One, Women Talk Torah, a series brought to you by Matan Women's Institute for Torah Study. Please do one-on-one and women's Torah learning a small favor by sharing this podcast with family and friends so that we can reach new listeners. You can stream and download these episodes on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, and Matan's website. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review in the comments. Please send us any feedback at podcast at matan.org.il. That's podcast at matan.org.il. Thanks for listening, everyone.